Hello everyone and welcome back to my podcast. This is Anne P of Fiber, Floss and Fiction. Today is Saturday, uh, September 28th and it's uh, 2019. I hope everyone is doing well. If you are a returning viewer, welcome back. And if you are new to my channel, welcome. I hope that you find some things here of interest to uh, stay and visit with me for a bit. This podcast is about my crafty things, uh, knitting, some spinning today, cross stitch, as well as books. As always, I will include timestamps below for those of you who have interest in one or part of those list of things so that you can find your way hopefully a little bit more easily through the video. Uh, today is just about the end of September here. Um, we are not having the kind of weather that they're having up in Montana today, which is fine. Not quite ready for snow, but uh, it is definitely feeling like fall here and I'm looking forward to the change of the season into October as well. We've had just some beautiful days. This time of year in northern New Mexico up here in the mountains is pretty much picture perfect. Um, highs in the mid 70s, sunny, bright blue skies. Uh, it cools down at night. So when I take the dog for her walk in the mornings, it's usually right around 50, 52 ish degrees. So I have a sweatshirt on and it, it just feels great. So yeah, really loving that weather right now and looking for excuses to spend some time out in it. When I'm done um, recording today, I'm going to go hang out on the porch with some knitting and stitching and probably finish the end of the um, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. I've got that on audiobook to listen to, which I've been enjoying when I do my morning walks. Uh, so let's see. Um, otherwise, things are good here. I am headed off to teach at Stitches Salt Lake City next weekend. Uh, I will be in on Thursday. I have a class Friday afternoon and then Saturday morning. So I will be in the Yarn Guys booth uh, Thursday afternoon, assuming my flight's on time. Um, should be, it's a direct flight out of Albuquerque, so I suspect that it will be. Um, and then Friday morning, I will be in their booth as well uh, before I head off to teach after lunch. Um, doing a book signing. Uh, around 1230 I believe it is on Friday if you are planning on attending that event please swing by would love to say hello and um, meet and greet I know there's several of you who I know in real life who I will have the opportunity to see uh, for those of you who don't know my husband and I actually lived in southern Salt Lake not in the city but it's kind of the southern end of the county. Um, when we first moved out west, he worked at the University of Utah. So I actually have people I know in real life <laughs> to potentially see while, we're, while I'm there, which should be a really fun time. I'm excited that Stitches has decided to open an event there. So I hope that it's, it's well attended and uh, I hope that it's, you know, good for them and good for the local crafty community. So uh let's see got a bunch of stuff to talk about today so just gonna kind of get going on things um so let's go ahead and let's start off with my usual knitting i'm still working on my chauncey sweater let to see here is the very crinkled cover photo of it the pattern is by isabel kramer it is a top down uh, fingering weight yoke patterned sweater, kind of casual for fall. Um, I'm actually teaching a yoke construction, yoke sweater construction class, and I thought it would be nice to have more samples. I ha have several, but um, I think it's good to always have different weights and different uh, construction techniques to kind of illustrate how things look. So it never hurts to have more samples is my thought on that. And this is actually starting to, you know, look like a sweater. Um, I have been continuing to work on the body and I'm, I'm past the halfway point on it. Um, again, knit from the top down. So started up here, uh, worked the color work 
here on the yoke and just working round and round. This is gonna be my travel project while I travel to Salt Lake, so I'm hoping I can get quite a bit done on it. It's really mindless at this point. Uh, it's There's no shaping, so you're just knitting a tube. And once I get that done, then of course I will come back and put the sleeves on stitches and finish those up. The colors I've used here are both Holy Wonka Fibers Ayrton Sock. Uh, the gray is called Chimney Sweep. It's a very subtle speckle dye. And the dark green is called Forest Primeval, which is kind of a dark foresty green. I think this will be a really nice lightweight kind of toss on over um, a tee or camisole kind of weight sweater for fall, assuming I get it done, but also for spring. Um, so I've been working on that one quite a bit. Um, one thing I can show you, which is not going to be a uh, pattern for sale, but is going to be a sample, is a piece that I'm working on for a new yarn that the yarn guys, uh, my friends Dennis and Jeff, are carrying now in their shop. I don't think that they will have this in their booth for Salt Lake, but I do know they are planning to take it to Stitches West, which is the February show in the Bay Area. It's a really interesting combination of uh, a linen uh, interior core and then it's spun with baby alpaca on the outside uh, to create kind of almost like a mohair feel, but it's super, super soft. Um, this is the like midnight blue colorway of it. And um, once I get a little further along, I will show you guys the image that I'm using as inspiration for this piece. This is going to be one of the pieces on the runway uh, to kind of kick off them carrying this yarn and I am working on a beaded dress. Um, it's going to have kind of stars and snowflake patterning on it and so I am working this using crystal silver lined size 6 beads and I love how this looks against that dark midnight blue. I think it's going to look amazing and super shimmery under the lights. Um, I did speak about this project last time we talked and it's it's a big project so here's all of it now that you can kind of see me working on it but it's over 400 stitches and it's beaded so it's a slow project but like I said I love how that looks. I love how the sparkle is showing up. The drape in this is amazing. Uh, and I will be creating a pattern that will have similar design features to this full dress uh, that would be a little bit more manageable for somebody who wants to knit something for themselves. Um, it will also be beaded and will be the same yarn base. So we will look for that later on in the year slash early 2020. So working away on that, Excuse me one second sorry about that I'm back um, so more to come on that sweater information when we get a little closer to 2020 which is mind-boggling to me that it's we're in the, the fourth quarter of the year all almost a couple more days um, let's jump on and talk about hand spinning so I did finish up the singles for the um, Roving that I was spinning, again, this is a Three Waters Farm roving. It is an 80% merino, 20% Tussa silk blend, and the colorway is called Early Blooming. It was from her Top of the Month Club, I think two years ago, a couple years ago. Um, so the singles are done. And these are ready to be plied. Um, get, I will get to that. Not sure it will happen this week, but hopefully between now and the next time I talk to you guys. Um, so these are done. Nice and squishy and soft. Um, and I'm actually going through one of my tasks for kind of the end of the year is I'm going through and doing a little bit of cleaning, de-stashing, reorganizing of some of my craft projects and um, 
just consolidating some of the rovings that I have. I've got a few that I'm going to donate and just kind of getting my craft space downstairs cleaned up. Uh, one of my things that I have on my list that I'd like to get done next year. Uh, so we have a split level house and the downstairs has our wood, wood fireplace insert and it's kind of the dog bat cave. She sleeps down there at night. And then my office is down there. Uh, we have one room that like connects to the garage and the room that my office setup is in is huge. And um, it's kind of in need of like a little sprucing up. So I would like to repaint and maybe put a big comfy chair down there. The light's actually pretty good. Um, we do have decent sized windows down there, a big picture window and then other smaller windows. Um, and I'm thinking that I might like to have some other space down there. So kind of rearranging some of the craft stash supply stuff. So that's on the to-do list. Okay, let's go on and talk about books. So I have read, let's see, one, two, three, four books in the last two weeks. Uh, one of which, which we'll start with, is called The Lost Prince that I had started last time we talked. This is by Julie Kagawa. You may remember that I really enjoyed the first book in her Iron Face series. Um, if you're interested in that review, check out my previous video. There's information about the book in that video. This is the same world and similar characters. It This one focuses on the main character, Megan, her younger half-brother, Ethan. Um, he's four in the first book and he's a pivotal plot point in the first book. Um, this book focuses on him, so it's the same world and Megan appears in this world, but it's 10 year, 12 years in the future. Um, so I didn't like this book as much as I liked the first book of this authors that I read. I felt like this one was a little bit more in that place where you've become a successful author and so your contract says that you're gonna, you know, you, you get to write three books on this concept. So it felt a little unfinished to me. Um, the characters weren't quite as well developed and I think she leaned a little bit on the fact that you would have read the other books. Now, the first book in the Iron Faith series um, that I read and reviewed, there's three more books in that, that set that deal with that group of characters specifically. And so then this one is kind of same world, similar characters, but slightly different group. So I think it assumes that you have read the other three in between and perhaps I would have liked this one better if I had read everything exactly in order. Um, but I could get this one from my library and it fit a prompt for magical stitches reading. So I went ahead and got it and read it. It's not a bad book, but I think I would either want to go back and read the ones that are prior to it in the continuum and maybe then reread it or skim back through it. I suspect I would like it a little bit better, but the main premise is again that there's this this young man, Ethan, who uh, while he does not have magical powers, when he, in the first book he's four and he's stolen away to, by one of the fairy courts and his older half-sister goes and rescues him. Um, so he kind of grows up knowing, knowing what fairies are and being able to see them unlike most other humans. And he's kind of the kid with the chip on his shoulder and he's uh, a bit of a handful at school and he really doesn't want anything to do with the fairy world but these creatures appear that are kind of half vampire half fairy and he takes upon himself to go to his sister who is at the iron court, the Iron Fairy Court, and tell her that they've not only infiltrated the mortal realm, they're in the in-between and they're trying to figure out how to attack fairy. 
So it's that adventure. Um, like I said, I was a little bit bothered by the fact that it didn't completely finish the story up. It really left some pretty big ends untied, which drives me nuts. Um, but I think if you like the first book and you read the series, you probably will enjoy this. I mean, it's more young adult fantasy, um, nothing too graphic, nothing too violent, no sex to speak of, entertaining read. Um, I do like the author. I certainly could see me reading more by her. Um, the next book I read was a book, I thought I had it with me, but it's called Chance Developments by Alexander McCall Smith. Um, this book is not his best well-known book. He is the author of the number one ladies detective agency, which was a bestseller and is probably something, a uh, title more familiar to more people. I have not read that one. This is actually the first book of his that I've read. And I really liked the concept of it. Um, I have it in print. My dad sent me a copy. And what the author has done is he has five black and white photographs that are all from right around the turn of the 20th century that feature um, couples in them. They have at least two people in them. And they're things like that you would pick up if you went to an antique store. They're unidentified. They just have, they're just pictures of somebody's life, a moment in somebody's life. And so what he's done is he's written five stories that tell the story of that photograph. So he creates the personas for the people and the backstory and what was happening when the photo was taken and the story around their relationship in, in that photograph. Um, all completely fictionalized, obviously, he doesn't know anything about the photos, just they were things he found that were charming and he includes the photos in the book. So I love the concept of that. Um, the stories for me were kind of uneven. Uh, there was one that I really liked and the other four I was kind of so-so mm, about. Um, they're very sweet. There's, they're nothing earth shattering. Um, they're just little like sort of relationship vignette stories. So if he's an author that you love, maybe you would also like this book, but um, it wasn't one that I adored and will keep on my shelf forever and ever. Um, I kind of, I felt like it was missing a little something. Um, I would have liked there to have been maybe more going on in the stories. I don't know. Anyway, so Chance Developments. Um, the next book I read was this one called Mr. Penumbra's 24-Hour Bookstore by Robin Sloan. And I read this one for a magical stitches prompt for an author with the initials RS. Uh, I just went to the library and walked up and down the bookshelf until I found one that fit the bill. And I have to say, I was really pleasantly surprised by this one. Um, it's kind of an unassuming little book. I know nothing about the author. I knew nothing about this book. It is kind of a combination. Um, it reminds me a little bit of Hitchhiker in terms of the tone of it, um, the voice of it. And um, several of the books I've read in the last year that are about kind of lost libraries or lost books um, so the main character is this young man who worked for, uh, in the Bay Area, worked for a dot com and kind of got shuffled around as things changed in the world of dot comers. And he's out of work and basically just looking for a job. And he walks past this bus stop and he realizes that there's a wanted help wanted sign in the window kind of in the shop behind this book this bus stop and it's this bookstore so he goes in and he applies for the job um, he's a big reader he uh, has this one set of books that are these um, fantasy books kind of young adult fantasy that he read when he was a kid that have been important in how he views his life and the best book ever is kind of how he looks at, at that set of books um, 
he gets hired by Mr. Penumbra, who owns the bookshop, to be one of the, uh, there's two clerks plus Mr. Penumbra who works in the bookstore. And the bookstore is open 24 hours a day. Um, his, this young man's task is to man the front desk. He's not to ask any questions. He's not to look at any of the books that are behind the desk. He can only look at the books up front, um, which are this sort of odd assortment of used paperbacks and novels and sort of strange things that have been collected. And there's one other clerk who, um, the main character, Clay, he, he works basically 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Mr. Penumbra works 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. and the other clerk works the 3 to 11 shift. So one, one of them is always in the shop. Occasionally, he, this young man comes to find out, this strange person comes in and he has to go into the back stacks and get down a book from a very specific location. They have a log book that shows where everything is, but he's not to open the books or look in them or know anything about them. And he's, all he's supposed to do is get the book and then he's supposed to put a note in the date book that they have under the counter that says who came in, the person's name, their um, bookstore card number, like a member number, and a brief description of them. Um, you know, hair color, what they have on, were they in a rush, that kind of thing. So his curiosity winds up getting the better of him and he can't figure out what's exactly like how this bookstore stays in business because they don't really sell very much. They have basically no books worth buying in the front of the store and all of the books behind the desk are ones that you borrow and then return. So there's no cash exchanged whatsoever. So he decides that he's going to build a computer algorithm that will track what books come in and out. And he builds this virtual uh, map, if you will, of the shop. And he starts trying to figure out if there's a sequence or if there's a pattern to what books are being borrowed. And while he's working on this, this young woman comes in who happens to work for Google. She's picked up the bus outside, um, or the bus schedule outside, and she's waiting for the bus. And so she comes in to just, you know, see because the store's open. Um, and she becomes fascinated with this program that he's written. And she keeps saying, oh, well, you know, I work at Google. We could do all this stuff. And Google knows this and Google knows that. And we could actually find out what's going on. So he undertakes this quest um, to sort of sleuth out the mysteries that are contained in Mr. Penumbra's bookstore. And it's one of those things that has a lot of tongue in cheek about how computers rule our lives and how Google rules our lives. The like insider information, um, this author must have worked in the dot-com and or had friends or maybe himself who actually worked at Google because it, the descriptions about the stuff going on inside Google are really, they're, they're very on point and quite funny. Um, so this young man undertakes this, this quest to figure out what's going on and um, he winds up getting several of his other friends sort of sucked into this quest um, where they each assume an archetype from the original young adult fantasy book that he read as a kid, um, including one of his friends from his childhood. Um, and they go off to find out more about this secret society that is the sponsor for not only Mr. Penumbra's books, bookshop, but other bookshops throughout the world that are housing this amazing secret. Um, it's not the secret of life and it, it kind of all comes crashing down around them, but he, the author brings in this quest story, all of this sort of tongue in cheek humor about 20th century books and reading and how computers have changed our lives and um, sort of like alchemy and old tech and secret societies and all this sort of very campy cloak and dagger stuff. 
anyway, I really enjoyed this book. It's kind of hard to describe what genre it's in, and it's not a super long book. It's just under 300 pages. Uh, I, I really loved it. This is my sleeper of the week. Um, I'm so glad that I found it. I just loved it. It was, I, I, I would highly recommend it. If you have any interest in books, about books or books about readers, um, this is a good one. This is a good one. Um, and if you are somebody who liked uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and kind of how that was written and its tone, you will also like this one, I'm pretty sure. So recommendation on that one. And then I read a book called A Potion to Die For. Oh, you know what? I actually have five. Hang on one second. Let's back up and talk about Uneasy Lies the Crown. Yeah, this is my list. Uh, Tasha Alexander is the author. Uh, this is a historical mystery. It is set around the very early 20th century. Queen Victoria has just died. Uh, Edward VII has just taken on the throne. And um, before Victoria dies, she gives one of the main characters in this book a sealed envelope that has some cryptic Latin written on it um, and then soon after Bertie takes the throne um, a series of murders happen that are all tied to one of the British kings who was killed while they were the monarch um, this is book I think 13 in a series and there may even be more after this one but my folks sent it to me and I picked it up not realizing it was part of a larger series. Thought, what the heck, I'll read it. Um, does do a pretty good job standing alone. I'll say that first. I have not read books 1 through 12, so no idea how they are. Um, the two main characters, uh, Lady Emily and her husband Colin. Colin is uh, works for the monarch. He is sort of the person in the Secret Service charged with their protection. Uh, Lady Emily is his wife. They apparently have had multiple adventures doing other things and solving other crimes. So she's very much the blue stocking and very independent and likes to go off and investigate things herself. So I missed probably a little bit of sort of the backstory of the two of them and how her there's a few of her friends that are pulled into this story I, I think I probably would have benefited from having read at least one of the earlier ones but it, it wasn't super grating on me so like I said stands alone pretty well um, nothing out of the ordinary totally crazy i like the characters the plot was really fun i like the fact that they had to figure out all of these sort of hidden clues the murderer would pose the body in a certain area that was reflective of the historic period that the monarch that the dead body was supposed to represent was killed in um, and would leave a clue about the next killing. There are four killings in all. Um, it brought in some of the social history of the time, the turn of, at that turn of the century, moving out of the Victorian era, era into the Edwardian era. So that was nicely done. Um, yeah, good plot, good pace, good characters. I would pick up ones earlier in this series now that I have read this one. Nothing earth shattering, but if you're a historic mystery fan, um, you might check out Tasha Alexander's other earlier books and see if you like Lady Emily as well. Now let's go on to, uh, what was the other one called? A Potion to Die For. Uh, fulfilled a prompt for Magical Stitches. I didn't even write down the author. I didn't really care for this book. Uh, set in Arkansas. It's a little town. The main character is a witch and she runs a potion shop. She's a good witch. She has a cousin who is the bad witch who sells hexes and nasty spells. Uh, the book opens with the good witch finding um, the, one of the local lawyers in this small town dead in her potion shop. 
and so the rest of the book is a mystery story. I think it's a cozy, can, would fall under the cozy mystery category with then like witchcraft and magic applied over the top, but in a kind of cute, cutesy way. Um, very, like everybody's very down home and all shucks and all gee and countrified and there's a Dolly Parton imitator and stuff like that. It was short and I finished it. It was not really my cup of tea. So uh, if it is yours and you like cozy mysteries, um, of course, all the links to that and my other books I've talked about will be down below for Goodreads. You can check it out yourself and see if maybe it's something that you like. Um, but I read it because it had potion bottles on it and checked that box. Okay, that is it for reading. 20 some odd minutes of books. Okay, so finally, let's go ahead and let's move on to cross stitch because I have a bunch of things I've been working on this week. Uh, first up, let's talk about Village of Hawk Run Hollow. I know you've seen it, you love it. I have been using this as my 30 minute a day project. Some days I work on it a little bit more. It really just depends, but I'm trying to get 30 minutes a day on it, no matter what. Um, and I am definitely making some progress. Last time you saw it, I think I had just finished the grist mill or was close to finishing the grist mill. This is block eight. It is done. Um, I think I hadn't finished it yet. I was maybe close-ish, but it is done now. And it is um, personalized with my great uncle Claire's name. He and my great grandfather um, ran the dairy farm together. My uncle Claire was a bachelor his whole life. He never married. He stayed living with his dad. Um, he actually predeceased my great grandfather. He, um, my grandmother always said that Claire never roughhoused with the other boys. There were three other boys that survived. Um, he was always very quiet. I always have a picture in my head of him. If you think about the like Dust Bowl and Depression black and white photographs, that was kind of my how my Uncle Claire looked. He was very tall and lean and very dour looking, but when he laughed, which wasn't that often, but when he laughed, I mean, he laughed. He had a very dry sense of humor and um, just really kind, sweet, soul. Um, I loved him as a little kid. He, he was always very kind to me. Um, so my Uncle Claire, he definitely was somebody who, I mean, he loved the farm and he loved all of the agricultural things. So um, I commemorated him in that particular block because I always think of him as being kind of the, the son of the family who kind of, that was his calling. So the grist mill is done and I have moved on to block nine. Um, no personalization in this one, it's just the, the words. So I have the words up here obviously to finish and I'm in making a good progress on this kind of middle full coverage part. There are two figures over here that I need to add but just gonna keep on working on that. I'm actually gonna work on that this a little bit this afternoon once I'm done recording. And uh, yeah, just gonna keep plugging away on it. I still am not totally sure I'm gonna get this block and the remaining three done in the last three months here of 2019. But if I don't get it done this year, it's for a for sure finish for 2020. Um, I had originally only thought I was gonna get through these. So I've exceeded my expectations. Um, yeah, so really enjoying that. I am doing this uh, one over one using DMC, not the silks, on a 22 count hardanger in the colorway Legacy from Picture This Plus. Okay, there is that one. Ne oop. Next up, I worked on Brenda Gervais' uh, August Wordplay. I needed to work on a figure 
I uh, can't remember what else the prompts on this were for. It doesn't really matter, but just know that I, wor I worked on this this week and actually got a fair amount done. Um, I am stitching this using Color and Cotton. No, I lied to you. This one I'm actually doing using mostly the Gentle Arts threads on a 32 count linen. I can never remember the name of this, but it is a picture of this plus. So I added in all of the sunflowers that you see and the red flowers down here. And then I started on this big old dress of the lady with the, the watering can. So got that one worked on a bit this week. A little back to summer kind of thing. Okay, then I also pulled out um, for some extra credit. This was the only project I had that began with an H, a B, or a P, which is what the extra credit prompt was. And that is, excuse the crinkling. This is Harold, who is one of the figures from the Bayou Tapestry, and it is um, a reproduction of part of the larger Bayou Tapestry which I got as a Christmas gift from my nephews a couple of Christmases ago. And this is not cross stitch, it is actually bayou stitch, uh, but I got quite a bit done. I filled in the rest of this part of the horse's neck. I filled in all of this part of the cape as well as this part of his sleeve. And I did some of the um, stem stitch that outlines everything. Oh, and the saddle pad. So it was fun to work on. It was fun to do something a little bit different and it does go pretty quick, especially these big uh, sections. Um, I mean, it's a lot quicker to do that than it would be if I was cross stitching it. So give you like a little detail there of the texture. Um, no specifics on that. If I have a reason and an excuse to pull it out for a homework prompt or something like that, I will. Otherwise, um, you know, no specific goals to get that finished. Um, then for uh, the autumn birthday sal that Leah Noel over at Aviatrix Stitcher is has been hosting for her birthday this past Monday, the 23rd. Happy birthday, Leah. Um, I pulled out autumn leaves, which I was very happy to get a chance to put some stitches in on because I hadn't worked on this this year. And it was, I think, I think it's the only piece I haven't worked on. There might, might be one other, but, um, but yeah, and it became fall since the last time I talked to you. So I am working on the larger rectangular one. I'm stitching this two over two on a 36 count Zweigart linen. Whoops, throwing my threads around. I think this one's called Winter Moon, if I'm not mistaken. I have a tag somewhere. Um, I'm using all color and cotton threads. And I finished these two lines of the text and added in all of the brown that you see, basically that section this section and the box where the center motif will go. I don't know if you guys can hear the dog. She's having dog dreams again. Uh, yeah, so really happy with how this is coming out. I love how the hand dyed floss looks in the, the fall leaves. I think that looks amazing. So um, again, no specifics, um, like no specific prompts to work on that but um, it is fall and I love stitching on things that are themed for the season so if I get a chance I'll see if I can't haul that one out again too. Uh, I have just the last couple of days I have been working on my desert mandala which is by Chatelaine. Um, I have been working on this for one of the magical stitches extra credit prompts the prompt was the one related to something to do with Aragog, the giant spider. 
And if you look right here, there's a dream catcher. And the web shape of the dream catcher is actually supposed to be a spider's web to catch bad dreams as you have them. Um, and that's what that symbolizes. So that's what I chose for that one. Um, I'm working this on a 28 count even weave in the colorway Calypso. Let me hold it back here and try to show you the whole thing currently. And then let me show you what I worked on. I came in and I added this side. Um, basically all of the colored silks that you see in this upper border as well as over here. I also started the background of the like night sky. Um, and I also completed all of the Jessica stitches, rice stitches, the extra like specialty stitches that live in there. So when I come back to work on this one, um, I'm done with it for the 500 stitches I needed. I'm gonna add the beads in on this side that I needed, as well as all of the spots in here that you see that are empty, those are all beads. So I'll go ahead and bead this, and then this will be done on this section here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'll be done all the beads across the top. They will look like. Uh, this one will probably come out again in October. Um, I have a couple of prompts I think I can use it for with the different like blacks and oranges. So I will probably go ahead and pull that out. Um, so you, you'll probably see that again in, in October, but um, done, done with it for this, this week. And then finally, I have been working on, um, I don't think I have the cover sheet with me. Uh, but y'all will recognize this one, right? The massive one. <coughs> Excuse me. A Stitching Shelf, artwork by Amy Stewart and charted by Heaven and Earth Designs. I am working on page seven, which um, I'm actually making good progress on. Uh, again, this section right here that finishes this kind of um, crest is crazy crazy in terms of confetti. Um, this book will not take me too much time. It's actually, I think, only five or six colors in this section right there. And then I can finish filling in the rest of the trailing roses. So once I have this page done, I will be at my goal for this year on this piece. Um, so I'm gonna work on this this weekend a little bit, see how far I can get done. My plan with this is to switch up to which way for October. If I have time to work on this, I will, but I'm very confident I can get this page done before the end of the year, just even if I work on it, you know, in bits and bobs. Um, I did wind up uh, downloading um, onto an older Google Ready tablet, uh, the new Pattern Keeper app. If you haven't heard of that, um, I'll link to her website below. Uh, so it, it's like a PDF tracker where you can mark your patterns, but it is so much better than anything I have used on my iPad. Uh, that's a normal, normal PDF type app, much easier to use, much beefier. It keeps count of your stitches, which when you're doing cross country, that's super helpful. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, I highly recommend it. I wish that they would get the iOS version out quicker, um, but it's uh, like at least a year away. So until then, I'm going to just use this old version of the Samsung Android, whatever, because I have got Google Play on it and it downloaded the app with no problem. And um, it is a for pay app but totally worth the every penny in my opinion uh, for full coverage. And I believe the developer is also working on expanding it to work with more than just full coverage. So you could put any PDF into it 
and still be able to mark it. Um, like the Chatelaines are not formatted the same way as the Heaven and Earth designs. So you can't mark one square on it. You have to just use the freeform tool for the Chatelaines, which can get kind of messy. Um, it's just, it's not as good as it could be. It's better than nothing, but it's, it could be better. Um, so I saw a note on the Long Dog Samplers Facebook page that she has um, allowed the developer to start playing around with some of her designs. So they should be able to have it more compatible for other PDFs like Long Dog Samplers that include back stitch and half stitches um, in the future, which is great news. So yay, yay. Um, I'm in awe of app designers who can figure out how to make all that stuff work so well and seamlessly for us to make what we like to do that much more easy to do. Um, so more review on that. I mean, today's the first day that I've even played around with it. I just loaded it up. Um, I'm going to use it to work on this going forward. Um, one thing that the Pattern Keeper app does do is it calculates your percentage stitched. So I Based on what I have marked, I'm at 8.33% of that design. So, a long way to go. Um, I think that's it for today. Uh, I hope everybody has been doing well, enjoying things, seasonal changes in whatever corner of the world you happen to live in. Uh, like I said, I will be in Salt Lake next weekend and then hope to be back with another recording after I'm back to tell you a little bit about that event and talk to you about what I've been working on in between times. So until next time, um, everybody be well, be kind, talk to you later.